School for October 19, 2013. We're studying today the caretakers and usurpers. Interesting title. So let's see what we have. Uh, last week we had the subject of the, um, what was it, the bear, questions, the questions and, answers. and answers. Yeah, that was after the uh, time in the tabernacle. And now Jesus puts everything in perspective with a parable that goes back and covers many, many things that aren't covered in the lesson, but we'll mention a few of them. But before we go into the lesson, let's have a word of prayer, please. Amen. Father in heaven, we come to you with humble hearts, thanking you for this opportunity to share with those who were perhaps alone or those who would like to have another view of the lesson. Pray now that as we look at it, we will apply it correctly to ourselves and that we will learn from it for our salvation and for the example of others, help us to be a positive one. And now forgive our sins and be our teacher and guide. We need your aid at every step in our lives, and we thank you for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. We pray for our churches, for our families, for our children, our young people. Remember those in sick, those who are alone, and the needy and the aged. And we pray that your name would be glorified in what we do here in this next few minutes and hour. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Brother Suarez, summarize our last lesson for a moment, if you will, please. The last lesson was titled Questions and Answers. And really, the Pharisees had a lot of questions. Uh, Jesus had all the answers. It was about authority, that the Jews did not want to accept the authority of Christ. They wanted a Messiah according to their making, not the Messiah that God had provided. Yeah, and they know that goes back again to the prophecies that uh, pointed to the Messiah. And, of course, there are, you could say, two views of the Messiah, the suffering Messiah and the glorified Messiah. That's right. So they wanted the glorified Messiah, but we had to go through suffering before we have the glory. So that's the lesson of the whole scriptures, actually, and they misapplied that. And we have to ask ourselves, how are we applying it to ourselves as well today? And as I was setting the lesson, I was thinking, you know, we didn't bring in Daniel chapter 9 or the other prophecies about the Messiah, mm -hmm. but they're all there, uh, you know, encapsulated in what we're studying today. Everything that he was prophesied that he was going to do, uh, that he would be a man of sorrows, that he would suffer, that he would uh, be a healer, and that he would be rejected by the people. You know, this was prophesied in the Old and Testament. And he would be killed. And he would be killed, yeah. And so we see now, as we go to this idea, what God had for his people, the idea, the ideal that he had for his people as caretakers and usurpers. And I'd like to introduce the lesson with another text, if I may. Jeremiah 2, verse 3. It says, Israel was holiness under the Lord and the first fruit of his increase. So that's the first part of that text. You know, Israel was to be the first fruit of his increase. What does that mean? Well, in the sense of the first fruit of a tree or of a field or whatever, or of a, something that gave birth to something, the first fruit belonged to God. And that meant that other fruits were coming from that. So they were not to be the only ones. But it says, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, um, uh, saith the Lord. So what we have there is a promise that, like the apple of his eye, uh, then there was to be a uh, further fruit from Israel. But what we see here now, we had the lesson of the barren fig tree. Now we have another parable. Huh. It the says, vineyard. Mm -hmm. of the vineyard. Christ hungers to receive from his vineyard the fruit of holiness and self of unselfishness. He looks for the principles of love and goodness, not all the beauty of art can bear comparison with the beauty of the temper and character to be revealed in those who are Christ's representatives. So we have to think about what is really the fruit God is looking for here? Is he just looking for show or we know that's not the case? So I've identified four types of fruit. Four types of fruit. So from how, how did you do that? The fruit of the Spirit. Okay. That's one fruit. 
then we have the fruit of repentance. John the Baptist came and said, you need to have the fruits of repentance. Mm -hmm. What and does that include, the fruits of repentance? Well, that includes confession, that includes contrition, that includes also forsaking of sin. And that reformation in the life. A reformation in the life, it includes restitution, includes acknowledgement. So there's a number of steps yes. in, That's in repentance. That's very important. That's key, yes. And what other two do you come okay. up with? Okay, also with the fruit of righteousness. Throughout the New Testament, we have the fruit of righteousness. What is the fruit of righteousness? The fruit of right doing, mm -hmm. <laughs> of doing right before God, doing right to our uh, neighbors, of doing the works of mercy. All that is a fruit of righteousness. And then the other fruit that is mentioned in Scripture is the winning of souls for Christ. Mm, nice. Name them again, real short. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of righteousness, and the fruit of winning souls for Christ. Not necessarily in that order, but uh, those are four types of fruit that are brought out in Scripture and in the Testaments. Right. Well, very nice. That's nice to start our lesson with. And uh, it tells us we have some entrusted gifts or an entrusted vineyard. You know, I, I talked to my uncle uh, some years ago. I went there in, and, in Oklahoma. And... Um, he was a pretty well-educated fellow. He had, you know, a degree. He was a, um, an engineer. And um, he was the most educated of my grandfather's children, mm. of all. Okay. And uh, he later died, but I spent a whole day with him asking about his history mm -hmm. and about my grandfather and mm -hmm. how they lived and everything. And I asked him, did my grandfather ever own a piece of property? He says, yeah, three by six, which meant that he never owned anything. The only place he ever owned was where they buried him. He was a sharecropper all his life. Mm. And a sharecropper is someone who works a piece of land but has to give a portion of that to the one who owns it. And that's what we're talking about here in this, yes. in this lesson. So we, would call, yes. call it, we call it sharecropper here, but you know, that's not in the uh, vernacular of the King James Version or the Common Bible entrusted with the vineyard. And where does this picture come from? This picture of being entrusted with a vineyard. Comes well, this, from, this picture comes from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter uh, 5, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, chapter 5. I will show you, I will sing of my well-beloved a song of, of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful here. And it, it goes on for seven verses. It talks about the vineyard of the Lord. And I would imagine that in Hebrew it rhymes. Yes. It would be nice to read it in Hebrew. Oh. Yes. So we find here that um, it will lay, um, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. And that is because they didn't give to God the glory and didn't give him his own. Hmm. Now, when we talk about giving God his own, you named about four kinds of fruit, but a sharecropper has to give something to the Lord because he's, he's, everything he has is on loan from, from the owner. So let's now think about what kinds of fruit we're to give to the Lord. What kinds of fruit w would that be natural? If you we're thinking spiritually again, you're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of righteousness, mm -hmm. and the, the fruit, fruit of, of winning souls. souls. You know, Israel needed to be a light to the heathen world. And they just turned inwardly. They had failed in making contact with the heathen. God had said they were to offer terms of peace. If they rejected, they were to be annihilated. I mean, in our mindset today of, of the New Testament, it sounds really strong, but in the mindset of the Old Testament, there is a spiritual meaning that we are to go and share the gospel with whomever we meet. And if they're willing to know of the gospel, we are to continue. But we cannot make friendship with the world. We cannot participate in, in their sinful practices. But we have a right to tell them about Christ, no matter how worldly they may seem to us. Well, you know, this is um, what Israel was to do. And we, they had a very strong lesson in their Babylonian captivity that they should have learn something from because that promise and that you know actually the mercy of the lord lasted a very long time but
But the, God said the land would be desolate, and it did lay desolate. It did lay fallow. And it says, you know, it shall not be digged nor pruned or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this is on Isaiah, and that was pointing to that physical mm -hmm. thing that happened in Israel. Now, there's a spiritual side to that. And when we're asking about what was due the landlord, what is due the landlord? What does God expect from us? And I, I would uh, put it out our time. We have a certain amount of time. That's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. We have means that God has given us. That's tithe. And that's... That's commanded. That's required. And then there are offerings, which is free will, which shows our love mm -hmm. to God. And we also have um, other things that God has given us, you know, fruit, uh, first fruit offerings, our, um, our uh, service, our talents, we should be giving to the Lord. So we have a, uh, an obligation to return to the Lord those things of time, means, influence, and uh, talent that God has given to us. Uh -huh. And these are all on loan from the Lord. And so you talk about four different kinds of, of uh, biblical fruit. Uh -huh. of fruits. Uh -huh. Here now we're talking about four different kinds of uh, return on the investment God has made. And that is time, means, influence, and talent uh -huh. that belong to the Lord also. So... Now, what parable did Jesus present as an illustration we've already mentioned? And we're talking about Matthew chapter 21. And here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to a husband and went into a far country. Have you ever planted a vineyard? I've never planted a vineyard. We have planted orange trees. In yeah. Florida. <laughs> well, it's pretty much the same in a way. Um, we've planted, in terms of a vine, watermelon, mm -hmm. cantaloupe. Well, if you plant a vineyard, it's, you know, you plant a tree and you prune it. But if you plant a vineyard, you have to prop it up. You have to stretch wire or whatever. I don't know how they did it in ancient times, but it's a big job. It is, and it takes a lot of upkeep. Yes, and it takes a lot of time. Lot so here's a man who's planted a vineyard. He not only digged a wine press, what kind of a wine press do you think he dug? Out of stone, most likely. And that's not easy either. No. Uh, I'd like to interpret each of these symbols for our listeners. The vineyard is a symbol of Israel. The tower is a symbol of the temple that God had built in Israel. The hedge is a symbol of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. His law is like a hedge about us. And the landlord is God, the Almighty. Um, and the wine press, you can search, and it's pretty difficult to come to a, a direct interpretation to the wine press. But I have always understood the wine press to symbolize Golgotha, to symbolize Calvary. That's where Jesus stepped the wine press mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. I would like to compare it in our lives to the trials that we go through because through these trials, God squeezes out, you might say, or you know, puts away the things that aren't edible in our lives and purifies us. So it's a symbol of the purifying process that we have to go through to, to, to be a spirit-filled, we might say. And so we have these different elements and... They, they point to our Christian experience. And what about the, the, the caretakers? Who are they? You didn't mention those. No, I didn't take, mention the caretakers, but I believe those are the leaders of Israel. That's right. That's what I believe also. They're the leaders of Israel, they were the ones responsible. So it's like the innkeeper in the parable of the Good Samaritan. They are the ones who are to be taking care of it. In the parable, the householder represented God. The vineyard, the Jewish nation, the hedge, the law, mm -hmm. which was their protection. The tower was a symbol of the temple. And the vineyard had done, uh, and the Lord had done, uh, the Lord of the vineyard had done everything needful for its prosperity. So, you know, what could more could he do? He provided everything. So it's like in some countries, um, I've ridden in taxis in other countries. I asked the people, is this your taxi? He says, no. It's not my taxi. I get the taxi in the morning and I drive it all day and then I have to give the, the man who owns it, you know, so much money and I get to keep the rest. So it's kind That's of exactly like... exactly what it's like. It's what it's just like that. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Now, 
I've had an orange grove, and it's not like that with the orange grove. I have to pay the workers. It's more like the other parable that everyone works a whole day, and then they come for their pay at the end of the day. For the pay at the end of the day, and I have to pay everyone every day at the end of the day. Yeah. And people complain if I pay one more than the other, just like Jesus said. But here it's a certain share. Um, my dad has a friend that works in one of his lands, and he gives a share. He gives uh, 20%. of Everything he grows goes to my dad because he's the owner of the land. So he so owns there the certain, property. And, yeah, and, then, and someone else works it. Mm -hmm. And he gets a certain share, 20% of all the fruits that are produced. That reminds me of Joseph in Egypt. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right, so now what was normally expected from a vineyard after a period of time and care? What did the husband do at the time of the grape harvest? Mm. The, what was expected was you had to pay your rent. And it wasn't every month like uh, you rent a house. When was, when was it? No, it was at harvest time. Harvest time. You, that's where people had a lot of money. They sold, they worked the whole year, mm -hmm. and they had debts to pay. And so they had to pay their rent. And there's still places in Africa that they rent only one time a year. You have to pay the rent for the whole year. We don't have that in America. That would really be a struggle mm -hmm. for people to go week to week or month to month. And, but here they did not pay their yearly rent. And what did they do? What did the husband men do at the time? The Bible says that the husbandmen took his servants, the landlord's servants, and beat one and killed another and stoned another. And that is a symbol of the way they treated the prophets that were sent to them with messages. And these prophets were, were coming on Israel saying that they did not have the fruit of the Spirit. They didn't have love. They were taking advantage of the widow. They were taking advantage of the orphan. They did not have the true fruits of repentance. And the prophets were calling them to repentance like Nathan did with David, mm -hmm. for example. Like Elijah did with Ahab that we had a small reference to last week. So... They, Jesus is really telling a story. And keep in mind, as he's telling this story, people are drawing in. And the priests and the Pharisees, they are getting lost in the story. They're getting so excited in this story. There's no TV. There's no video. There, um, there are some theaters, that's true. But Jesus is a storyteller. He can tell a story to get everyone into it. And I tell you that I believe Jesus gave a lot more detail that's missing. We just have the backbone of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of, of the parable. And there are a lot, there's a lot more detail. And that's why we, when you compare the Gospels, there's things different in this Gospel to this other Gospel because Jesus retold the same stories in different manner. And when he told the same story, different uh, Gospel writers tell different uh, details of what they recall. But they are absorbed by this story of Christ, of the vineyard. They are the villains. There's always a... Landlord is... Villains are these husbandmen. And they were... Landlord, you know, they probably... ...paid their rent and so forth. They said, yeah, this guy's got right on it now. So, you know, he's talking about us. We are the landlords. And it turns out something different in the end, of course. And that's always the twist of it. That's the O. Henry of the story. So the husband were to return to the Lord a due portion of the fruits of the vineyard. So God's people were to honor him by a life corresponding to their sacred privileges. Yes, if you jump down to the last, almost to the last line, it says it was the privilege of the Jewish nation to represent the character of God as it had been revealed to Moses. This was the fruit that God desired of his people. This beautiful character, this fruit of the Spirit. And I noticed, I, I really underlined the word desired. God desired. <laughs> desired to see that desired. his character reflected. Yeah, I like that. The, the use of that word. So, in the purity of their characters, it says, uh, in the holiness of their lives, in their mercy and loving kindness and compassion, they were mm. to show 
that the law of the Lord was perfect, converting the soul. When I read this, I was thinking of Exodus 33, where uh, Moses asked, show me your glory. Yep. You know, that was the time when God was going to destroy Israel. And it's very interesting how God did that, because he showed him his glory, actually in the threat to kill Israel. And when Moses said, no, take my name out of the book of life, he was actually, Moses was actually reflecting the character of God when he said that. Yes, he and was. it was, it God was, was revealing that. And this was a wine press experience for Moses yes, it right was. at that right. point. So mm -hmm. God was putting him between a rock and a hard place, mm -hmm. as, you, as if he were putting him in the, in the wine press. Mm -hmm. And God was squeezing out of him his true character. No, don't destroy them. Take my name out of the book of life, but save the people. And you know, before he says, take away my name, there's this line in the scripture. That's because there's a moment of truth. Mm. There's a moment. Don't, don't, don't do that, Lord. And if you won't do that, then... And there's this pause. Moses is thinking, what's the greatest argument he can come up? Lord, you love me. You want me to be with you. Then remove my name. Well, that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. And God showed him his glory, and it says, The Lord, merciful, gracious, uh -huh. long-suffering, abundant in goodness uh -huh. and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And it goes on, of course, to say that there's the other side of the story, that those who do not confess will suffer the consequences. Yes. Question three says, did the caretakers deliver the owner's share later when more servants were sent to receive it? Well, you know, this is the reiteration of the story, and Jesus is digging the hole deeper and deeper, we could say, because he sent other servants more than the first, and he says they did likewise to them. So he didn't just make one, you know, he did it again. And I'm sure these Pharisees were thinking, you know, I too had mercy and patience with these people who weren't paying me rent for that. And I did send some more people. And they did the same thing. They rejected them too. So they're really feeling, I think, that they are identifying with uh, the abused landlord. You, yes, I think you're right, Larry. And I had not thought of that until you brought it out now. And these Sadducees were very rich. Yeah, they, they were had very, a lot of property. Yeah, a lot of property. And so they were really identifying uh, with what was going on. But as the husbandmen had killed the servants whom the master sent to them for fruit, so the Jews had put to death the prophets whom God sent to call them to repentance. So now we have here the fruit of repentance. We had the fruit of the Spirit with the character of God, now the fruit of repentance. So messenger after messenger had been sent, the husband and uh, had been placed in the Lord's vineyard were untrue to their trust. You know, many times we think that we can make up for one deficiency by being over generous in another. Mm -hmm. And this is very common. That's very heathen-minded. Yeah, very. So I'm sure they thought that if there were any defects in their lives, you know, all the blowing of the trumpets and the giving of the alms and everything that they had done would made up for anything, you know, that they had missed. But, uh, you know, Jesus made it over and over again a plain that their fathers had done the same thing that they were doing. They're no different. They're no better. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the usurpers treated treatment of the son. Now we get a little bit closer, closer to home. They have still... That knot that's coming closer to the neck. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving them plenty of rope as we see. <laughs> what happened when the divine owner uh, of the vineyard sent his most noble representative, his son? So, you know, you send your servants... Then you send your heir. Your heir. Wow, that's really, I mean, they're going, uh, he's following the hierarchy. These are trusted servants. They've mistreated them. I will send my son. But at last he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. This is the heir. They're going to have reverence to him. Mm -hmm. This is a, a concept that the Jews had a lot of difficulty in accepting, that God had a son. And that's in the Old Testament. In the book of Proverbs, it says, do you know his name and do you know his son's name? Mm -hmm. And throughout Scripture, you find this plurality of God. So now Jesus is telling them the story of sending his son. And following your line of thought, maybe these Sadducees are thinking, oh, I've sent my son to them also to well, get the rent. Well, you know, in the in Jewish line of thinking, too, the, the inheritance of the son is the most important thing in the whole society, isn't it? Well, yes, the firstborn. 
Yeah, the firstborn. He takes twice as much as anybody else. And that was, that was so ingrained in them that the, it, everything had to be by the inheritance, the priesthood, you know, the... That's right, everything was inheritance. Larry. Everything was by inheritance. So yep. when they, he said sent his son, that was very significant in the Jewish mind and the Jewish economy. So at, as a last resort, sorry, a resort, God sent his son saying, they will reverence my son. The Jewish rulers did not love God, therefore they cut themselves away from him. Yeah, Jesus tells the story and says when they saw the son, they gathered together like a huddle. This is the son. We kill him, we keep the inheritance. Yeah, no How short-sighted. Really short-sighted, and I think that's the problem with sin, that it, it, it blinds us. It makes us short-sighted that we can only see sh a short distance. We can't see far. We can't see into the future. The consequences of our actions today, seconds of nominal pleasure to suffer an eternity without God. Not an eternity in hell, but an eternity mm -hmm. without God, without living. Mm -hmm. That is going to be the ultimate consequence. There's, there's a statement in the notes that says, Already they were planning to slay him whom the Father had sent. Now, what is the day? When, it, when did Jesus say this? What is the relationship to that statement? That's the day that the, that the lamb is picked. It's on the 10th day of Nisan. So he's telling the story on the 10th day of Nisan. Yes. The day that the lamb is being set apart. Yep. And it says, already they had planned, they were planning to slay him whom the Father had sent to them. And, and them as a last appeal in the retribution inflicted upon the ungrateful husband and was portrayed the doom of those who should put Christ to death. Now notice, God is not condemning them. Mm -hmm. Christ is not condemning him. He's just telling them a story. And what we're going to see what's going to happen here. So yeah, That tent started Sunday night, and it continued up to Monday morning. And that's exactly when they picked the lamb. That's exactly when Christ is telling the story. That's exactly when the Jews are meeting. So there's thinking. no coincidence. No, no coincidence. Yeah. So having reached the very critical point, what did the husbandman uh, des uh, deserve? What did he deserve? What did the husbandman deserve? Yes, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? Jesus poses the question to the group. Perhaps the high priest was there. The, all these Sadducees Identifying and Pharisees. Identifying now with the husbandman probably. Yes, they're what identifying. Right? Yeah, the you know, isn't it our right to take out those widows and to take out those orphans because they haven't paid? And we've sent and they've mistreated. Maybe they've thrown rocks at, at my servant or they've mistreated my son. They, they couldn't help hold themselves on. And they said, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. They're probably even thinking of Christ. He's going to destroy them. You are the false husbandman that's taken... The that has not given us credit and credit. not given us That's right. honor, has not obeyed That's right. the rules, the rules has, has disobeyed all the things that we have set up. Of the Mishnah, of the Midrash. So many rules. Yep. You're, you're the one who's the unfaithful. That's servant. right. That's what they're thinking. And then they jump and they say, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. Miserably, they say. Destroy, not just destroy, but miserably destroy those wicked men. And that's what they were thinking about Christ. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. In their seasons. So uh, they were looking at the fruits in a what kind of a way? What kind of fruits were they looking at? Well, they're Things looking that fill their pockets. That's right. And we need to look at it spiritually. Uh, we need to understand that here Jesus is saying that the vineyard is going to be given to the Gentiles, that he's going to lend it to other husbandmen. These are the pastors, the leaders of the work. And they need to render to him fruits in their season, in their early reign and in the latter reign. Yeah. And the early reign, it was the apostles. These are going to be the new husbandmen of Israel. It's not going to be the leaders now of the tribes. It's going to be the apostles and those that will be taught by the apostles. And they gave their fruit. They had the fruit of the Spirit. They had the gifts of the Spirit. And they reflected the character of God to the world. They preached the gospel in one generation to everyone under the sun. And now the responsibility has fallen on us. We're the husbandmen now. 
we have been given the vineyard, and now we need to prepare a people through instruction. The priests and teachers need to be faithful and instructors of the people that they will give fruits in their season. In this season of the latter rain, we need to prepare a people. In this season of the end, the final harvest is coming. I'd like to come back to the, to the wine press idea again mm-hmm. because we see that the, the, the disciples of Jesus were clustered in Jerusalem for quite a while until persecution came. That's right. And that caused it to spread. So when we see trouble and disappointment and conflict, this is God's means of making known that which couldn't be known in any other way. You know, I was just telling the story of the, mm. to the children about Philippi and, and mm-hmm. Paul and Silas. Yeah, I remember that. Mm-hmm. In Philippi, you know, they had stored the word of God in their minds, and there they were praising God. And, of course, they tried to put them away and, uh, you know, cause them to stop. But when the earthquake came and the great light was shown about the place and uh, people in the whole city were woken up, what, what happened now? God, through this simple means, notified everybody in Philippi, and Philippi became a very strong center for Christianity. So we see that God uses this wine press to squeeze out, you might say, and produce that... Uh, uh, oblation to to the Lord and what's emphasized here in the note of question five is that um, Christ designed that they should that's very key to this ruin on themselves it's Nathan and David all over again Nathan tells the story David listens and says he will pay four times David condemned himself. He paid four times, four Mm -hmm. of his children were as good as dead when he said that. The next subtitle, Faithful Husbandman. What else did the Lord say referring directly to his impenitent hearers and the people as a nation? What did he say to them? And what is written about the unfaithful servant? Now it's mixing in another parable also. Yeah, uh, it's... um he uses the word that's very hard for people who want to possess. And that is that, they, that it's going to be taken from them and given to a nation bringing the fruit thereof. So when I read this, I was thinking of Jacob, Jacob and Esau. Mm-hmm. Jacob, you know, we, what, when, people, when we ask people what does Jacob mean, it means deceiver. Well, it doesn't mean deceiver. It's come to mean connotatively that. But Jacob means supplanter, one who takes the place of another. That's what it means literally and simply. That's the connotation meaning, not the sub... uh, um, That's the main meaning of the word Jacob. So Jacob took the place of whom? Of Esau, who was earthly-minded, who thought of, you know, the, the good things of earth, the nice meal or whatever. That was important to him. So Jacob took the place of, of his brother. Now we look back at a hundred and... So many years of Adventist history, we should have entered the kingdom by now. Mm-hmm. We are actually Jacobs who have taken the place of others who haven't fulfilled the mission. Now, are others going to take our place? Mm. Are we going to be Esau's and other Jacobs are going to come? Or are we going to fulfill the promise that God has given? So God has said he will give it and bring forth to those who bring forth the fruits thereof. You know, I talked to you before about... Uh, history of certain people, and there's a pattern in the lives that people tend to repeat, and we need to be those who break the pattern. Mm-hmm. Break the pattern of our Definitely. past and of our history and of our inheritance and lay down that selfishness and come to the point, as, as you mentioned out about the fruits, of the fruits of repentance, the fruits of righteousness, and the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. In Matthew 24, it's bringing out the fruits of the flesh. Violence, gluttony, drunkenness. My Lord delayeth in his coming. This slackness in the Christian life. Those are the fruits of the flesh. And we must realize we either have the fruit of the Spirit or we have the fruit of the flesh. You know, I was reading that verse again in in Galatians chapter 5. And it's interesting to me. It says that the works of the flesh are. Are. And the fruit of the Spirit is. Yes. Very big difference. Very big difference. So there's a multiple areas, but when you're in Christ, there's a singularity in the life. Amen. That singularity is yeah, Jesus. When the eye is single, Jesus said, mm-hmm. then the body is full of light. 
So upon what holy foundation, and, and, the, and the lesson brings out here in question six, the lesson is for us, the church of this generation. We need to Amen. remember that. Yes. What, what holy foundation, upon what holy foundation do all good and faithful servants build? On what? the true fruit, on the true first fruit, on the true branch, and that is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. Blessed is that servant that imitates his Lord. Jesus says there's nothing more for a servant to do but to be like his master. And those are the wonderful words that Jesus is going to welcome those that enter into his kingdom. Come, enter, you blessed of the Lord. The cornerstone is a very interesting uh, symbol here because he's using this in this parable. And I don't know how it really was. I've read about it several times. But when you start building a building and you're building the wall and this cornerstone doesn't work, it actually cracks or crumbles or whatever. What do you have to do? You have to take the whole wall down and put the proper stone, cornerstone in place and build from there. You just can't make a simple repair. You have to start, because nothing fits anymore after you put the real cornerstone there. So you have to really start on the true foundation. So if we have been building on the wrong foundation, and the wrong foundation is uh, mentioned or alluded to in the sixth question, which is the physical things, uh, so, but what, with what wonderful words will they be welcomed into the kingdom of the Lord if they build on this holy foundation, which is Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. What yeah, is Blessed, that? come, be blessed of my Father. Blessed is that servant. He that believeth in him shall not be confounded. <clears throat> faithful, come faithful and wise servant. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, <coughs> shall find so doing. Jesus is going to have a lot of wonderful words to say to those that have taken on his character. The note brings out that Jesus took on Adam's guilt and took on the guilt of his posterity. Now we take on Christ's righteousness. Mm, wonderful thought. Yeah. Christ's righteousness. And we are his posterity. We are the posterity of Christ by faith. And the, this idea of the tried stone comes from the temple of Solomon, yes. the stone that they threw around in the courtyard. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what to do with it. Why did they send this big stone here? It was in the cold. It was in the rain. They moved it here. They moved it there. People tripped over it. And after trying so many stones, somebody got the idea, why don't we get that big boulder over there that's been a nuisance? <laughs> yeah. And Jesus says that blessed is he who is not offended because of me, that we need to fall upon that rock or that rock will fall upon mm -hmm. us. And then they put all the weights and the stone held it all. Held it and Jesus can hold your cares, my cares, your worries, my worries. He can help us in our afflictions, in our wine press experience. You know, I wrote something in my notes here, and I, I don't want to be um, offensive to anyone, but I put SDA. When I think of 1888, they built on the law. Mm -hmm. But 1888 was to return the church to build upon him who gave the law in mercy and grace and truth. Uh -huh. There's a difference. There we can a... understand that. So in infinite wisdom, God chose the foundation stone and laid it himself, it says. He called it the sure foundation. All uh -huh. who make him their dependence rest in perfect security. What does it mean to make him their perfect uh, uh, security? It doesn't say to make the law or obedience, but it says to make Christ their dependence. So let's not rest in what we have done. Let's not rest in uh, what our minister is doing or what the church is trying to do. Let's rest in him. And that's our perfect security. The church is very precious in God's sight. He values it not for its external advantages, but for the sincere piety which distinguishes it from the world. And what we need today is what we needed all along, and that is a... a uh, true reformation in spiritual uh, piety and dignity before the Lord. May the Lord help us that we might realize that God has required of us fruits, but he is the one who is going to produce them as we trust in him and not in ourselves. So let's go back through the lesson real quick. What were the four things you said? Four things are that God expects from us the fruit of repentance, the fruit of 
righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of winning souls for Christ. And one last note, Jesus is the caretaker. He's the one that brings about these fruits in our lives. Yes, and he has given us uh, time, means, talent, talent, and influence. Right. And we need to pay our dues to him. And we will if we love him and realize where they come from. Amen. God bless us in this is my prayer. Would you close, please? Yes, Father, we thank you for the study of thy word and we ask you forgiveness for our many sins. Be with those that will listen on and those that will study the lesson that we may not be usurpers, but that we may be caretakers of thy vineyard. For your glory and honor, in Jesus' name we pray. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Next week we're going to have give to Caesar that which belongs to him. So God bless you, and may we all enjoy uh, seeing the fruits of the Spirit in our lives and in the lives of others. Amen. Amen.